Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, here today we have Professor Peng Wei, who will give a talk about multi-agent reinforcement learning for aircraft separation assurance. Um, so Pro Professor Peng Wei is currently an associate professor at the Department of, De of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at George Washington University. His current focus is on the safety, efficiency, um, and scalability of decision-making systems in complex, uncertain, and dynamic environments. So I think he'll provide a very good um, outline and base for what some of our robots might look like. Okay, uh, shall I get started? Do you have anything to say, Professor? Oh, no. Uh, th thank you very much, Julia, for, for, for inviting me and having me here. So it's uh, uh, my pleasure. I'm very glad to uh, spend this uh, weekend evening with everyone here. Um, so today, I guess we'll talk about uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning for aircraft separation assurance. I guess from the right. AI or autonomy side, it's going to be like reinforcement learning or multi-agent reinforcement learning has some neural network flavors in it. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, you guys will enjoy it. And from application side, is like aircraft. I guess it's larger size of uh, robots. So. Yeah, hopefully I'll make it more fun. Um, so if you have short clarif uh, clarification questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, you know, the question that will sort of um, uh, block your understanding for the future slides, you know, feel free to ask. Um, but other than that, you know, I'm happy to uh, have a discussion, uh, you know, after this talk, uh, right after this talk. Okay, yeah, sounds All right. good. Let's start the presentation then. Okay. Yeah. If you're ready. Yeah. So, um, so this work is a sort of joint work with my three former students. Uh, so Mark Britton uh, now works at MIT Lincoln Lab. Uh, it's uh, like a federal FFRDC, federal funded research, whatever center. FFRDC. Yes. Uh, and then Xu Xi now is a research scientist at uh, TikTok or ByteDance. Uh, so he's a uh, Evil guy who designed the recommender systems that will, you know, cost teenagers a lot of times on TikTok. I'm just kidding. Like he actually spent uh, two year, uh, two summers at Airbus uh, for summer interns. Uh, but in the year of 2020, um, the aviation industry was not in a good shape. So he yeah. joined uh, TikTok. Um, you know, he actually does design recommender systems to recommend videos for. Um, TikTokers. And then uh, oh. the, the third guy is Josh Bertram. So previously at uh, Collins Aerospace, uh, now part of the Retheon technology, uh, but now he left, uh, now works at Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Lab. Uh, it's a U, I guess UARC, University Affiliated Research Center, kind of like uh, JPL to Caltech. Uh, Johns Hopkins has uh, APL. So, um, all right. So, a little bit about my group. Uh, we call ourselves uh, Intelligent Aerospace System Lab, or IASL. Uh, the main focus of us is models and algorithms for design and operations of air transportation and aviation systems. Uh, we also do some of the cars or ground transportation work, as well as uh, robots work as well. But mainly, we focus on aviation side of things. Um, so our training usually, you know, the students in our group are usually coming from uh, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, electrical and uh, computer engineering, and computer science, uh, applied math, and physics. So those are our background. Um, but myself, I was trained as a control and optimization guy, so more like a classic uh, model-based or physics-based decision-making uh, approach. Uh, but more and more, I started to do, I guess, in the past six, seven years, I do more and more learning-based uh, control, sort of uh, data-driven control, uh, or reinforced learning is one of them. Application-wise, um, so I work on pretty realistic um, applications like air traffic control, air traffic management. Um, and we also work with airlines on the airline operations. So some of our models actually have been deployed uh, by the FAA and by, for example, American Airlines that will impact your travel almost every day, especially in weather days. So some of we do are really practical, uh, but some of we do are really sort of um, tr 
kind of real, uh, uh, futuristic, but not that futuristic, I guess, near future. So for example, we work on small UAS or small UAV traffic management. Uh, those are the smaller delivery drones. Uh, we also believe the future of aviation is not only AI autonomy, but also just like cars is like electrification. So we also start to do some work on battery modeling, battery uh, prognostics, uh, things like that. Uh, and then uh, today, I guess we'll use urban air mobility as a background application. Um, so these are the me medium size uh, vehicles that will transport uh, passengers and cargoes. Usually it's a four seat or eight seater um, aircraft will transport um, cargo and passengers uh, within a city or between city suburb uh, or in the rural area. Um, and then we also have a hardware based project called, uh, you know, autonomous drone racing. So it sounds very different with the first five. The first five is like, how do we fly safe? This one's like, how do we fly recklessly? But uh, it's a nice project to engage the students uh, because it's had the, have the hands-on perspective on it. Uh, and you can see most of our work on, on the decision making side or planning and control side. But this work sort of force us, force us to start to work on perception side, like uh, you know, sensing, uh, computer vision, or other type of sensors, uh, things like that. All right. So moving so, on. Yeah, go I ahead. I have a question. So is this lab only, is this like a university lab, or is it one outside of your university? It's a university lab. It's a lab oh. under a university. Yeah. Oh, I see. OK, thank you. Yeah. So. Urban air mobility, the core idea is here to use vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, like uh, showing in this figure, uh, to transport you know, people on cargo and uh, people want this vehicle. But we do have VTOL vehicles already nowadays, which are the helicopters. Uh, you know, the new things here is uh, we want to do like electric propulsion, uh, basically electric powered, and also we want a short or certifiable autonomy, which means the airplanes can fly itself. Although the current day's airplanes can already fly mostly by itself, uh, especially long distance flight, I guess 90, 95% of time, the pilots will put on, you know, autopilot. Uh, they usually only handle takeoff and landing phases. Um, but yeah, so now we are talking the full, you know, autonomy cycle, which is indeed challenging. Uh, the goal here is to, uh, the community wants to build a safe, uh, efficient, and affordable transportation mode. Uh, the challenges here are, of course, multiple. Uh, for example, vehicle design. Uh, we are, you know, uh, using the new propulsion, which is a battery-based vehicle instead of like engine-based. Uh, the manufacturing also have some new challenges. The infrastructures, unlike the smaller drones, those vehicles do need some sort of takeoff and landing area. So city needs to buy in, uh, policy and regulations need to follow, um, or at least to lead the way. And also uh, my group only mainly focus on operations, but some of uh, what we do will sort of uh, help the decision making for, you know, policy, infrastructures, vehicle design and manufacturing. Uh, so we started this work very early on, like um, Uber, we know Uber like a uh, on-demand taxi company, but uh, they actually have a little division back in 2016. They started, this is called Uber Elevate. Uh, they start to paint the picture uh, or architect the, the concept of this flying air taxi. Um, so we started work with them very early on, uh, also since the beginning, 2016. Uh, we also work with Airbus, um, on you know how do we safely integrate autonomous aircraft into the you know civil uh, uh, airspace? So that's what we also work on. Uh, so uh, this is 2017, and you know that year uh, Airbus uh, you know invited three academic groups to work for them, and uh, our group was one of them. Uh, so this is another overview slide before we go to the technical part. Uh, it's another overview of what we do um, in our group or in our lab in the topic of urban air mobility. The first one is arrival management. Um, I guess I'll leave the business knowledge a little bit 
you know, not in too much detail. But why we focus on arrival first, because we imagine the airspace around the arrival airport will get congested first. So we, and also the batteries are running low. Uh, so we want to design the energy efficient arrival trajectory. Uh, so this part comes from the optimal control. Um, unlike the robotics motion planning, I guess the classic literature is to plan waypoints. But in aerospace and mechanical engineering, we care about the tra entire trajectory. So it's X of T, uh, mm -hmm. continuous trajectory, and also the control variables along this trajectory, which is, which is U of T. So that's some optimal control stuff. Uh, we also do some battery remaining time prediction, and also how do we pr prioritize who should land first and who should land later, depending on their battery remaining time and so on. Um, the second and third columns, um, the motivation is really about how do we not let aircraft crash into each other. Uh, so for the separation assurance, uh, what we really want to do at first is uh, we want this function or this algorithm or this model to be equipped um, in every single aircraft, so in a distributed way. So basically, it's like a pedestrian behavior, right? So if you go to a very busy mall, uh, I mean, there's no coordination of each of the, you know, uh, person. Somehow we all try to, uh, you know, deconflict with each other, right? We we all all we know where to go, but we don't plan our trajectory. We somehow like do this in a online fashion. Somehow we do not crash into each other. So. That's the notion of separation assurance. It's really like a decentralized way. Um, and then autonomous ATC, uh, from the beginning, what we did is we, we designed an agent, it's a reinforcement learning agent, sort of replaced uh, the, human, the centralized human ATC job. Um, so this is more like a centralized method. But today, what we are going to talk about is to combine both of them. So we will see the algorithm is implemented in a decentralized way, um, but we work on a structured airspace uh, like this. So we will see, uh, you know, the routes, uh, the merging points, the intersections. So we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Um, but imagine if we have some sort of algorithm, either decentralized or centralized, either through low-level automation or high-level high autonomy, somehow we can do better than human ATCs or human pilots, there's still a, a capacity of the sky, uh, which are the physical capacity, uh, just like uh, boats. Uh, we have the wake turbulence uh, after the uh, aircraft. I mean, two aircraft can never get too close. I mean, there is a physical limit, which is the airspace capacity. Um, you know, when the capacity and demand or traffic demand become imbalanced, so for example, in certain area in Seattle, um, you know, we have the road infrastructures, we have the highways, we have the local streets. Um, there's the different cases, the traffic demand and capacity become imbalanced. So for example, uh, the peak morning hour and peak, you know, traffic in the evening, those are the cases they become imbalanced, right? Because you know, the, at those times, the demand is surging. So that's why, you know, I have imbalance. And sometimes I'm not, I think Seattle also ha have a lot of rains and maybe snow. When those weather happens, uh, we can see it also have possibly have some congestion, uh, which means my those places where my capacity dropped, uh, either because of the visibility reduced or because of the rain, or is there because you know the snow caused some some crash and the lane closed one lane and that capacity dropped? So we we also will see some uh, you know uh, congestion. So what we do here is to how do we mitigate those congestions uh, by doing some congestion management? So unlike cars, uh, we can actually delay the aircraft at the departure gate. So like when you take airplanes for travel, yeah. like sometimes you find out, hey, my airport is fine. Why I'm being delayed? And you are told, hey, because it's the destination airport or somewhere on the way, there's weather. So that's that. And then fleet management or fleet dispatches inside each uh, airlines. How how do we run you know, the dispatching algorithm and scheduling algorithm? All right. So 
today we'll focus on this two. Um, so here comes uh, some demo on the, the left. second and third column. On the second and third column. We'll okay. focus on the second and third column. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, so first of all, we'll take a look at the structured airspace versus uh, free flight operations. So on the left-hand side, we'll see a structured airspace. Uh, in this case, a very simple case. We have three routes, uh, one from left to right or west to east, the other from east to uh, west, the other from north to south. Um, we want to do two things. The first thing is we want to separate the aircraft along each route. That's super easy. I mean, we just maintain the distance, uh, just like adaptive cruise control, like some cars already have today. But the other thing is not trivial. Um, we need to also manage the intersection. I mean, but we don't have traffic lights here. We don't have stop sign. We don't have roundabout. I mean, how do we separate them, you know, very well? So. That's some sort of human intelligence. Looks easy, but it's not that easy. So I think in your school, you know, you have highway or uh, sorry, hallway or uh, you know, you have some path, um, you know, on your lawn or near the school building, and somehow the students are walking, the teachers are walking, but somehow you managed, you know, change your speed, and uh, somehow you will not uh, collide into each other, right? So. This is what we are trying to do today. On the right-hand side is, I want to design an algorithm uh, on the uh, yellow aircraft and make sure that yellow aircraft do not crash into the red guys. Uh, so more like a pedestrian behavior. But you can see all the red guys are keep bumping into each other. So can we do this for every aircraft in this map? So we'll see that at the end of this talk. But today's main part, we'll talk about this part. This part is okay. a little bit more fun. All right, Mari, here our research problems are twofold. The first one is a conceptual sort of innovation, which is, I guess you guys probably cannot tell the difference, but it's sort of um, controversial in aviation world. Uh, basically, we want to shift the conflict resolution task from the ATC to flat deck automation. So if this can be done, it means the ATC will be highly automated, and we all know highly automated, you know, high automation often means the job loss in certain job category, right? So oh, yeah. that's why it's controversial. And then um, second, I mean, not, okay. And the other thing, of course, people worry about the safety. You know, do we really want to replace human with machine and in charge of such a safety critical mission? like? If a reinforced learning algorithm make a mistake in recommender system like Netflix or or the YouTube video or uh, or what news I'm looking at, if in those cases the rec recommender system, which is essentially a like a simpler reinforced learning algorithm, when they make mistake, that's okay, nobody will die. But when it, in aut autonomous driving, in airplanes, in surgery robotics, when those places make a mistake, we have huge consequences. So. Um, you know, we'll talk about that later uh, at the end as well. The um, second part you, is, Sorry, I have a question. Could you reiterate what flight deck is or like... Oh, right. So it's basically yeah. the people call this cockpit or flight deck. Oh, which okay, okay. A little room like uh, pilots sit. Oh, I see. Okay, I get it. Aircraft. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then um, the other part you guys can definitely understand. So we want to design a real-time and decentralized decision-making model uh, because we want to en enable autonomous separation assurance in a structured en route airspace. En route means level flight. So we are not dealing with, you know, climbing or descending. We are dealing with, you know, level flight. Uh, so here are some state of art. Uh, so I, I guess I'll briefly talk about. Uh, so what collision avoidance and conflict resolution are done today? So air, every aircraft we, we take have this system called uh, traffic alert and um, collision avoidance system called TCAS. So this system is an uh, air-to-air system. So basically using the transponders on each aircraft. Uh, so basically, they will scan the beacon, will sort of interrogate each other. Uh, so they b basically will know how fast um, both of them are approaching. So anyway, 
So it's an air-to-air system. Usually it work on one-on-one case. It's the last defense against collision or air- aircraft crash. Even when our human ATC make a mistake, this system can pick up the error and you know resolve the you know uh, conflict res- uh, did do the uh, collision avoidance. Usually the system is triggered 15 to 30 seconds before crash. Usually it will only issue vertical maneuvers, like pull up or go down. Uh, because in the final 20, 30 seconds, lateral maneuvers, like change the heading, will not be so useful anymore. Um, and then the next generation of the system called ACAS-X, designed by Lincoln Lab, they use same display, same hardware, which is antenna and trans- transponders, all the same, but different advisory logic. The first one is a rule-based uh, system. Ba- basically, it's a lookup table. Uh, basically, if a two aircraft approaching like this, A should do this, B should do that. And if two aircraft approaching like in a different angle or different, you know, whatever speed, uh, you, 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 yeah, and then aircraft A do this, aircraft B do that. So it's basically a very well defined deterministic um, table, lookup table. Um, it's almost, almost like a reflex agent, a pre programmed, like a bunch of what if um, stuff. But then um, the next generation is a probabilistic model, which is based on Markov decision process. Um, it's a sort of non-learning version of reinforcement learning. Uh, so um, why people want to switch from fixed rules to probabilistic model? Uh, because there was a tragic crash in Europe. Uh, so in that crash, both aircraft had this TCAS system. And on that day, um, the ATC missed this, um, missed the initial, um, you know, uh, conflict resolution, which means, you know, he or she missed the, you know, the first chance to separate the two aircraft. Mm -hmm. Uh, So now it comes to the final 20 seconds and the system kicked in and system telling aircraft A to go up, telling aircraft B to go down. But at the same time, the ATC start to realize, oh, I made a mistake and start to telling aircraft A to go down, aircraft B to go up. It's the opposite of the how the system issue. And the two pilots were trained differently. Like in pilot A, he was trained in this case, always listen to the you know equipment, listen to the machine. And pilot B was trained as in this situation, always listen to the human ATC. So of course they crashed and all of the people died on two airplanes. And the follow-up was the dad of, you know, the two victims um, on the one airplane actually traveled from Ukraine or Russia, uh, went to that ATC's home and killed that ATC and then killed himself. It's a very tragic event. Um, what? Yeah. But this is where we know, like in your <sighs> robotics community, you will see, hey, you know, fix rule, a lookup table always work, right? You know. Follow mm-hmm. the deterministic waypoints always work. Why we need to do probabilistic stuff? Um, because when whenever the human gets involved, it's gonna be deterministic. There will be pilot non response. There will be delayed pilot response. There will be other sort of issues. Uh, that's why we need probabilistic way to to do things. Uh, a solution is basically solving an MDP uh, with discrete state space. And then to on the effort to try to replace human ATC, uh, they have the uh, system called Auto Resolver or TSAFE developed by NASA Ames. Uh, so this is a ground-based system uh, try to aim to replace or augment uh, human ATC's job. Uh, mainly that does conflict resolution, uh, usually triggered about one minute to eight minutes before crash. You can see this system have, has a longer look up time, uh, look ahead time, uh, but all of the three systems are one-on-one system. Uh, so they, they, they try to deal with those conflict or collision on a one-on-one base. And this system is centralized and this system is like airborne or like decentralized. So our algorithm will try to um, do something differently. So number one, our system is decentralized 
Number two, our system is probabilistic, which means we can handle those uncertain behaviors or uncertain scenarios. And number three, our system will trigger uh, longer. I mean, look ahead time is longer, not the final 20 seconds, but a little bit longer. And number four, uh, most importantly, our system uh, do this in a one versus many or one, one versus any scenario. We don't try to resolve one-on-one -on -one collision because okay. in a very dense environment, even we resolve this one-on-one -on -one and it will create the secondary or downstream conflicts, right? So it, it, it will be a mess. But then our system will look ahead um, wider. So we'll look at look at the, the na multiple neighbors around us and try to find the optimal maneuvers. All right, okay. so some reinforcement learning. Oh, I, ha yeah. I have another question about last slide. Yeah. So to get this right, every aircraft shares all three of these, or is it oh. each aircraft is different? Good like point, which... good point. So usually our most our current aircraft is equipped with this TCAS. Oh, okay. And TCAS X already passed many years of you know simulation validation, mm -hmm. flight tests, you know, all sorts of you know certification. And this one, you know, is ready to implement. So this one will replace TCAS very oh. soon. So those two systems are essentially the same. It's just the you know the logic behind it is different. And this okay. system is still sitting at NASA's lab, although it's developed more than 20 years ago, um, because people still don't trust, um, you know, somehow it's strange. Like people trust machine as a backup or last layer of defense. Basically, if human fail, somehow we trust you. But like when you try to design this and claim, hey, I can do a better job than human ATC, they also passed all sorts of you know tests and you know different validation process, and this hasn't been implemented. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. And what is MDP? MDP. Is it just a problem. Markov yeah. decision process. Um, oh, process. Okay. Right. So if you guys are familiar with Markov process, it's a bunch of. Um, it's almost like finite state machine, but in computer science, finite state machine is deterministic, right? So if I do this, I jump from this state to that state. But MDP is, sorry, at Markov process is probabilistic. So I basically will transit from each you know, one state to the other based on some sort of probability. Um, and Markov decision process means my sort of transition to next state, not only depending on my current state, but also depend on what the action I'm taking. And then that will lead to my next state. So that's the difference of MDP uh, versus okay. Markov process. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yep, no worries. And then um, uh, RL or reinforcement learning in already in aviation, those are some literature surveys, but the the key point is for traffic flow management, you know, people have done this already, uh, which means we make a mistake, no big deal. Um, we just cause some congestions or con congestion is worse. Um, but then in air traffic control, is this, uh, which is safety critical, our group was the first um, to do this um, because we were crazy enough to think about, hey, let's use the neural network and data-driven and probabilistic way to, to working a safety critical mission. Uh, so yeah, so we were the first to do this, but now this work getting more and more attraction and, you know, from Asia, Europe, um, many groups, uh, you know, follow our work. Uh, okay, and so speaking of that, we still have the argument that we are using a learning-based approach, which is data-driven, which have neural networking in it, we want to use it somehow to guarantee the safety of my flight. It still sounds risky, right? So it's just like when you one day you are taking a taxi and the taxi, there's no driver on it, and you are told all the perception, prediction, and planning and control are done with some machine learning or neural network in this loop. It's kind of scary, right? So that's that's the argument. Uh, that's the other part of my research I, I will talk about. 
But today, our approach is to formulate this problem as a multi-agent reinforced learning, or MARL, and solve it using uh, Advantage Actor Critique, or A2C. So I want to go to the detail, but uh, basically, the A2C works like this. Um, uh, so from the environment or the current state of my vehicle or robot, I read my state. Uh, state meaning, you know, the position, velocity, acceleration, and all that. That basically describe my current state. And this state comes in one module called critique. It's like my mom. So she will always tell me what a good or bad situation I mean. So he will, you know, tell me, okay. hey, you you messed up. Hey, you you are on the, your right track. So this is a critique. Mm -hmm. And then the actor, um, you know, so, okay. So say my mom doesn't tell me what to do, but she will tell me you are in deep trouble or you are doing well, uh, you are okay. But then we also have another block of actor, uh, you know, you know, this this person may be my dad or my teacher. Like this okay. actor will tell me, hey, you know, I know you are in a you know good situation, but here is what you should do. So this actor will tell me what my action is. So we have two modules here, right? So they work together to work together, right? So okay, okay. because this uh, act, uh, critique will generate um, a, a thing called TD error. It basically measures um my predicted way how good or bad is versus the reality mm -hmm. or at least in simulation you know i actually did have a crash or in reality i did fail my dmv test i didn't get my learner's permit right so that sort of difference is the td error and from this mm -hmm. td error the actor will learn will update and it will tell me what to do next. Maybe in my next learner, I mean, next driver's test, I will do better, something like that. Okay. Um, and multi-agent reinforced learning here, uh, we assume all the aircraft are cooperative. And later on, we we see some, we set some aircraft as non-cooperative, this still works. Uh, we use a notion called centralized learning and decentralized execution. I'll show you guys a little bit of what's going on there. Um, for any, you know, uh, mathematical formulation uh, or computer science formulation, uh, we do need to have some assumptions because with those assumptions, we can scope my, uh, you know, problem in a nicer way. So meaning um, I set up my fences. Within those fences, I can guarantee my method works, right? So without the fences, you know, I, I'm not sure, but within those assumptions, my method works. So those assumptions actually hold true in, you know, in root airspace. So I don't want to go through them one by one because it's not really related to robotics. Uh, I'll just skip. Uh, so this is a model we saw from the video. Uh, basically, we build a mock-up uh, airspace sector, and you know, we have this uh, routes building, uh, the three routes, and we want to manage. And uh, we we build this model in a simulator, a blue sky simulator built from TU Delft, like a Dutch university, uh, mm -hmm. open source simulator. And because reinforcement learning is more data hungry than supervised learning. So we need a simulator to generate a lot of training scenarios. So that's, uh, yeah. All right, so this slide maybe is the most technical slide. I'll spend a little bit longer time here. And then okay. the rest of the slides, I'll just uh, go through them fast. All right, so reinforcement learning formulation. Um, if you are familiar with control or control theory, I mean, those two things are, you know, pretty similar. Um, in order to make decision, especially sequential decision, uh, which means I don't want to stop after making one decision. I need to make sequential decision at every time step. I need to have those ingredients. The first one is state. So I need to know my aircraft status at every you know uh, time interval, right? Or I at time uh, every at every time step, and also I want to know my k closest neighbors status at every time step. Well, some people will ask. Let, let me explain the uh, the the table a little bit. So this okay. table, the first column, 
is all the states I can describe my own ship. Own ship means the algorithm I'm going to implement at. This is the, some people call this ego vehicle, or some people call this own ship. Some people call this the robot I'm controlling. Um, but those, you know, states could be the position, velocity, acceleration, and things like that. Um, and then I also want to know, in this case, my three closest neighbors, we call them intruders. Those, those three closest neighbors are the potential troublemakers that will possibly collide into, right? So in this case, I'm saying I want my own information. I also want the K, in this case, K equal to three. I want K closest, you know, uh, aircraft information. Well, some of you may ask, hey, Pong, you know, maybe I don't, only one the three closes or k closes because in a very crowded airspace i want k to be seven or eight because i need to watch for a lot more in a crowded you know airspace but when it's a quiet airspace like in uh you know in the nighttime the early morning like maybe i only need to worry about the two guys around me or only one guy around me right so what i really want is this k to be a variable number or varying number instead of a uh, fixed number. So how do we do that? Uh, so we will do that uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, the second ingredient is called action. It's basically what my robot or what my aircraft can do. In this case, we make it very simple. It can speed up, slow down, or hold the current speed. Uh, and number three, it's called the reward. A lot of other places call this differently. In control, people call this cost function or I guess performance index. Um, in machine learning, people call this, I guess, loss function. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people call this objective function, but like we call this reward. Uh, basically, it's at every single step, what kind of reward we are getting. If we accumulate those reward, that's my objective function, or that's my cost, or that's my penalty. Um, so reward basically means if the two aircraft are getting too close, uh, we have some pe penalty, in this case, negative one. When they are far away, we don't do anything. We don't penalize them. In between, we introduce some sort of negative penalty, very simple and you know straightforward to understand. Um, all right, so moving forward, we also define what is the episode because uh, reinforcement learning needs to learn from simulation. Uh, so here is the episode. We also need to define what's the terminal states uh, which means the aircraft either all safely exit or some aircraft uh, reach a conflict state or almost crash into each other. So those are basically the unsafe scenario. Uh, so those are defined as terminal states. In those cases, we stop the simulation and restart the next simulation. Um, so in this in this case, um, you know, centralized learning, decentralized execution. Those are some tricks to make sure the model is trained faster. Uh, essentially, one neural network is learned, and same weights are distributed to all uh, aircraft. Uh, so this is a little uh, we are cheating a uh, cheating a little bit uh, because we call this uh, multi-agent reinforced learning, but I'm telling you only one neural network is learned and same neural networks deployed to all aircraft. Um, in this case, we reduce the number of parameters. Uh, now we can do multiple air, uh, neural networks learning. But in this version, you know, let's stick with uh, one neural network, but sort of um, deployed into multiple um, uh, aircraft. So multiple aircraft still act differently because their local neighbors, local information are different. So they still act differently. Okay. Uh, so finally, A2C, uh, we talk about this, so I'll just uh, skip. Uh, this is another slide uh, I want to spend a little bit more time because uh, this is, has some to do with uh, you know, neural networks. So in this case, um, you know, we talk about this S. Uh, so if you forget about this, uh, let me go back. So what does S like? Right. So okay. in this case, um, S is my own ship. Um, states or my intruder states. So I'll go back. Oh. The notation changed a little bit. Uh, sorry about that. But it's basically this vector called SO and this long vector called SI. So I'll go to here. 
So basically, in this case, my I/O is my own information. Uh, as local is all my neighbor information, right? So in this case, I throw my all the neighbor information just in case my I have a lot of neighbors. I put in one layer of uh, neural network. So now I have an abstraction, which means I have a shorter, um, you know, vector. Um, so I can use, you know, uh, uh, fewer memory or fewer, I guess, uh, a shorter uh, vector to still represent uh, my neighbor's situation. And then my own information stay the same. I put those two vectors together and then go through the other two layers of neural network. And then my output V is actually my critique. This guy will tell me how good or bad oh. my current situation is, right? So this S, the entire S, including my own information and also my neighbor information. So this V of S telling me how good or bad uh, situation I am. And this pi is uh, act, the actor, actually. It's actually the policy. So this guy will tell me what action I should take. So this is uh, pi. All right, so case study, um, this you know model we already saw. Um, so in this case, we pumping 30 aircraft uh, randomly in this sector. We want to separate them you know, nicely. And those some results, um, you know, the blue curve, meaning the, the, the machine learning learning curve or training curve, uh, you can see gradually the blue, blue, blue curve becomes uh, all 30 aircraft will exit safely. And the orange curve, you know, with time, it, it shows, you know, none of the conflict will show up. And conflict drop to zero. Um, initially, this model takes two days to train, um, uh, very time consuming, but now, through years of you know uh, work in this, uh, now it takes about ten minutes to train very fast. Um, I'll skip this, and then here's the um, oh, actually maybe I shouldn't skip this. So, okay, we <laughs> train the model. Uh, so some people will ask, hey Peng, you trained the model, but all you did was using the training set, you know, to test this. Of course, it works well. So actually we use the same model and test it in some sort of different scenario. The model still works well. In some extremely corner cases, it didn't work, but most of the cases still work. So which means it performs still very well. Uh, so we saw this example well, working at the intersection. Uh, we also can work at the uh, merging point uh, like this. We know autonomous driving also have this merging behavior as well. But yeah, so it, it's pretty um, you know useful for for both cases, All right? So summary, uh, we propose the real time distributed separation assurance algorithm for en route uh, airspace. Our problem formulation is a multi agent reinforcement learning, so you can understand this as a problem formulation or a mathematic model. And our solution is um, you know uh, actor critique or PPO. We also introduce some tricks along the way. To make sure it's learned faster, uh, more scalable, and the simulation results show that this algorithm is promising to prevent loss of separation in a smaller scale use case. Uh, but indeed, we worked on a higher density, uh, 30 aircraft in such a small sector. All right. So that should be the end of the talk. But I have some, I guess, bonus okay. torture slides. If you like this, this is definitely a bonus. If you don't like this, it's uh, torture for your next about five to 10 minutes. All right, so uh, let me uh, finish this. Um, okay. So still curious about this. I, I think I showed you this uh, pedestrian behavior a little bit. You, you see the red, uh, the, the uh, yellow guy always doing well. Um, in a busy mall, he or she always go to the favorite store without collision, but all mm -hmm. the red guys are keep bumping to each other. All right, so we did a stress test. Uh, now we implement this to all the aircraft and see we all the aircraft you know, this is called the super eight uh, scenario. Uh, it's basically a stress testing. All the aircraft flying to the middle, we want to see each of them avoid each other. So uh, notice those airplanes, uh, the, you know, in some presentations, you will, you will see the aircraft will form a perfect swirl or whirl in, in the middle. Uh, because yeah. that's centralized algorithm. You know, all the aircraft are coordinated. They are told, hey, fly this trajectory. But in this case, 
all the aircraft are decentralized and there's noises into this. Some aircraft will act uh, you know, earlier, some uh, air aircraft will act later. So that's why you see this um, you know, uh, demonstrations closer to what we saw from pedestrians. Um, yeah. Building their mobility. So we did a markup on NYC, and then um, we did a you know some simulation. Uh, those uh, black circle with H in it is basically the helipads or vertiports or mini airport. Uh, so you can see the air aircraft start to deconflict with each other. Um, we purposely draw those icon larger. Um, it doesn't mean it had a collision or a conflict. It's just we draw them larger. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we also did some further sort of, um, so in this example, I need to worry about all the aircraft in this airspace. But in this example, we have a, like a honeycomb uh, cell-based model. We only need to worry about the aircraft inside each cell. Uh, we also have this uh, Tom Strong racing platform. So we have some hands-on uh, testing um, going on at least in Iowa State, uh, but in my new school, I haven't. Uh, we haven't uh, done this yet. All right. So last uh, about two to three slides. Um, you can see in this today's application, uh, we develop some learning-based algorithm. We have some neural network in it. Um, all the model, how the model behaves is actually from the training or from the simulation. Um, it does, it sounds very scary because we want to use this to do such a safety critical mission. Like when we make, make a mistake, there'll be uh, consequences. How do we build trust for machine learning and AI systems? No matter my machine learning and AI system exists in computer vision or perception part or prediction part or in planning and control part, but once we introduce that neural network, I mean, how do we make sure they are safe? So first part is whenever we deal with data-driven system or learning-based system, uh, what I want to know is how do we generalize better? I know it, it's working in training set. I know it works well, but when we move to real world, when we move to a test set, how can we know it still works? I mean, if it doesn't work, how can we know it won't work? You know, in, in either yeah. before I deploy this or even in real time, in execution time, how do I know it's failing, right? So, and in, when we have neural network in the loop, a lot of people treat neural network as black box, but then maybe we should study the, you know, mathematics and, uh, you know, it's basically a, mat a bunch of matrix multiplication with some sort of uh, nonlinear activation function. So instead of treating this as a black box, um, maybe some mathematic models and formal verification will work. Uh, online safety guard, which means a monitor, a monitor will check the neural network behavior, and it will, it will alert um, the human operator that when the you know uh, the neural network make a bad decision or unsafe decision. Uh, lastly, we also want to claim. AI might be easier to be verified using another AI. So back to my DMV example, like how do I certify a human driver? I just go to DMV and take the written test and the DMV uh, you know, person will take me to the road test for 15, 20 minutes. In those 15, 20 minutes, he or she, I mean, the examiner cannot exhaust all the scenario, right? So he or she will take me to traffic light scenario, stop sign scenario, even parallel parking or U-turn scenario. That's basically it. it. It won't, you know, take me, you know, test me on so, all sorts of scenarios because, you know, we don't have time and, you know, he doesn't have all day or all month to test me. But in AI, especially in, you know, simulator, when maybe Julia developed, you know, the world's best autopilot or world's best, you know, autonomous driving software, I can put, you know, this software into the simulation and run millions, billions of, you know, simulation on it. So potentially I can, you know, I can do better. So that's our argument that using AI, maybe, maybe it's easier to verify, who knows? Um, yeah, that's the framework of that. 
And finally, uh, even we use those testings, we use mathematics, uh, all different ways to show the system with neural network is safe. Uh, we have simulation results, flight test results, mathematic proofs. We, we are telling you, hey, it's safe. But you know, it's still neural network. I mean, to a lot of people, it's black box. Uh, so how can we explain the decision making to the human operator or to that so the only passenger sit in the autonomous you know taxi how do we show what the you know what the car is doing so that that part is uh, important too okay i think that's all i prepared uh sorry for taking so long but yeah oh it's great Any questions? thank you yeah that was a lot of information yes <laughs> um, you guys had fun it was very well explained i like the little jokes throughout um we have a couple questions here. So the first one is, are there specific places in the sky that your lab focuses on when studying interactions between aircrafts? Uh, or do you try to look at places all around the world? I are, uh, specific spaces in the sky, I see. So yeah. usually uh, for those more practical uh, scenarios, we do have you know, certain scenarios, for example, some part of the region from Ohio, part of the region from, you know, uh, state of Washington, you know, we do look into those realistic, you know, region of the sky. Uh, but in more like, um, for example, those reinforcement learning study, uh, we don't have to be more specific on certain region. So we are more interested in the more uh, generic or more general method will work on other places. But in aviation itself, um, I think usually the sky is divided into sort of level flight. We have mm -hmm. different methods to work on. And then we have, we call terminal airspace, uh, which is like a upside down cone from the airport. Because in that oh. airspace, we take care of the takeoff and landing and things become complicated. In there okay so you so you have access to look at the places all over the world i guess uh, at least the... in the states in the united okay. states um, our community is very small um so we have a lot mm -hmm. of data i think this question is very nice to uh, give you guys this thing if you want to look at you know or almost all the spaces in the world uh, you can try oh. this. Um, oh, I cannot do comments. How about private oh. chat? Yeah, if you send it to me. Oh, I see. Okay, I can yeah. copy it. Yeah, so you guys can take a look at this, uh, mm -hmm. where you can access all the archived aircraft trajectories and movements in almost all over the world. All right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's one more question that's... How are aircrafts able to perform per, perform vertical maneuvers in the time frame of ten to thirty five seconds? So I think this is from the slide traffic alert and collision avoidance system. Yes, a uh, great question. So if you saw the movie this summer, like Top Gun Two, you will see at the last twenty seconds they will pull the stick like crazy, like the oh. aircraft will go like this. I mean, not not as so uh, you know Top Gun because it's a boeing 737 or 787 it doesn't fly that aggressively like uh f-18 but still like you can relate it's some aggressive maneuvers at the uh, last 20 seconds okay okay that makes more sense i was picturing like the plane going ver like vertically anyways like, like this like oh, okay, okay. approaching and this yeah 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 all right this is another one what kind of computation power is required for the real-time traffic control algorithms? Whoa, very, uh, I mean, all three <sighs> questions are awesome, yeah. So for this, um, in the training stage, it's definitely take longer, uh, but once it's trained uh, in execution stage, it doesn't, um, so good question. So if you remember in my neural network slide, uh, my neural networks only, let me go back and share that slide. Uh, yeah, I can add it back on. Yeah. Very good question. Um, let me see. 
Okay. Yeah. So this slide, you can see, unlike um, you know, computer vision, um, neural networks, or like uh, NLP or uh, natural language processing neural networks. Um, usually, the neural network works for planning and decision making is much much shallower. In this case, I only have three layers, right? One and two and three. So in this case, I I can have a very lightweight uh, chip, like for example, uh, Jetson Xavier. Um, it can do it. Um, you know, doesn't require a whole lot of extra computing power. And um, plus, I think. Now the modern airplanes, uh, the avionics onboard the aircraft, is amazingly fast. So, yeah, now the airplanes are they have powerful computers on board. Like, let's just say that. Um, I forgot one thing. I forgot to mention. Um, if you remember, we were asking this question. We were saying, "Hey, Pong, I don't want my K to be fixed to be three or five. I want my yeah. K to be changing. How do I do that? So in this case, we actually replace this layer with the mechanism called attention layer, or like we can replace it with LSTM layer. So both of them are used extensively in natural language processing. Uh, what they do is, for example, if my this vector is not my neighbor's states, for example, this could be my entire previous paragraph. This paragraph can be a long paragraph, can be a short paragraph, right? So, so this is basically a varying, varying length of vector, but through this attention mechanism or th through this LSTM, I can encode this changing length of vector to a fixed length of abstraction. This abstraction in NLP is called context. It's basically, you know. You know, after Julia read this paragraph, I'm I'm asking Julia, hey, what did this paragraph say? Right. So Julia will tell me in 20 words or like in whatever, like this paragraph is saying this, this, and this, right? So this mechanism, no matter how you know my neighbor number of neighbors changing, I can always use a uh, attention network and then my encoded um, you know um, contacts or uh, this vector will be fixed. And all the remaining part will be the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that was really helpful. Okay. I think those are all the questions. Do you have anything else to add, Professor uh, Peng Wei? No. I guess no matter no? like where your stage uh, you guys are, like middle school, high school, whatever, if you are interested in aviation type of work or research, summer internship, uh, whatever you want to do, uh, let me know. So I'm uh, happy to uh, to work with you or point you guys to the right people or right references. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for your time. This is an hour. Yeah. Um, it was a great lecture to hear from a professor such as yourself. So thank you so much for taking the time with us. Um, this talk will be recorded. So if you would like to share it with um, any of your friends, kids, if they want to watch it too, that would be great. Okay. Um, but if there's no more questions, I think we can end the live stream right here. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you everyone. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Bye.